Prosecutor Karim Khan, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. And of course, we're here at the ICC. You are today announcing that you are applying for arrest warrants for top military and political leadership in the Israel-Gaza war since the October 7th events. First and foremost, explain to me exactly what you're asking for and who you are charging. Today, Christian, we've applied for warrants to the pretrial chamber of the International Criminal Court in relation to three individuals uh, that are Hamas members. Uh, Sinwa, who's in charge on the ground. That's Yahya Sinwa. Absolutely. Uh, Daif, uh, who's uh, in charge of the Al Qasim Brigade. Uh, and uh, Hania, who's uh, one of their political bureau based in Doha. Let me just, for everybody to understand, Yahya Sinwa is the head of what they call the Islamic resistance movement, Hamas, the military operation, or even, even wider. Mohammad Diab Ibrahim Al Masri, otherwise known as Dave, commander in chief of the military wings Al Hassan Brigade, and Ismail Hania, head of the Hamas political bureau. What are the charges? The charges are extermination, uh, murder, uh, taking of hostages, uh, rape and sexual assault uh, in detention. Uh, so these are the, the key uh, crimes that are alleged to have been committed by these three individuals. Uh, the world was shocked on the 7th of October when people were ripped from their bedrooms, from their homes, from the different kibbutzim uh, in uh, Israel. And um, people have suffered enormously and we have a variety of evidence to support the applications that we've submitted to the judges. And just tell us what the evidence is. Obviously, the world has seen the real-time images. The Israeli government has put out videos, which it's shared to the UN and others, journalists, about what happened. There are body cams on many of the Hamas fighters, whoever was there at the time. Is that the evidence, or do you have more? We have more. Uh, we have uh, authenticated videos and photographs. We have CCTV uh, ca uh, camera uh, pictures. We have uh, eyewitness evidence. We have evidence of survivors. I mean, it's remarkable the victims and survivors that have uh, from Israel that have engaged with my office have this righteous demand for justice and accountability. They've come here. Uh, I've also met them in the different kibbutzim, and uh, they want justice and accountability. Um, so we have also expert evidence. Uh, so there's a whole variety of uh, information that we have authenticated that we think is relevant and probative and that is sufficient, we say, to sustain the, the crimes that we put forward to the judges. You have also issued warrants against the top political and military leadership of the government of the State of Israel. We've applied for warrants. Of course, the judges must determine whether or not to issue them, but we've applied today uh, will apply for warrants for Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu and also Minister of Defence Gallant um, for the crimes of uh, causing s s uh, extermination, um, causing uh, starvation as a method of war, including the denial of humanitarian relief supplies, uh, deliberately targeting civilians in, in conflict. And um, the sad thing really is in relation to both categories. Um, I have been saying repeatedly um, in Cairo in October last year at the Rafa crossing on Israeli television in Ramallah, um, everywhere I can, to the parties to the conflict, comply now, don't complain later. And, of course, hostages have not been released. That insidious crime it continues... Um, for so many innocent uh, Israelis that are in custody, uh, you know, are held hostage by Hamas and families that are waiting for their return. And, of course, we see pictures of starving children, of emaciated children. Uh, we have a variety of evidence uh, to support, um, not polemics, but evidence that's been forensically analysed to sustain the charge also of starvation being used by Netanyahu and uh, Gallant uh, as a method of war, and it's awful that in 2024 we have had to submit these applications to the judges of the ICC for warrants. I'm going to get into starvation as a weapon of war in a moment, but first I want to ask you, the word genocide has been used by both sides, and many believe that genocide is being committed, but you do not. You're not using that word. Well, this is an active investigation, and we have... Uh, 
criminal charges that we can use, genocide, war crimes and crimes against humanity. In relation to this current stage of investigations, the charges that we have put forward to the judges do not include genocide. But we are continuing to investigate. It's a very complex situation. We have not been allowed access into Gaza by the Israeli authorities. We are also continuing our investigations in relation to the Hamas attacks. And if and when the evidence points us in a particular direction, uh, we will not hesitate to act. So it's still an active investigation. But yes, what today is, we haven't. What is extermination? It's mass killing. Different than genocide? Yes. Genocide is defined by specific intent, not only uh, killing, but an intention to destroy the group in whole or in part. So it's a specific intent to destroy the group in whole or in part. So uh, we're not, we have not uh, included in our application today um, a request for warrants for the crime of genocide. So extermination, war crimes, crimes against humanity. I want to ask you about starvation because although it was accepted by the ICC as a, a war crime when you were created in 1998, I don't believe it's ever been prosecuted before as a weapon of war. No, it's not that I'm aware of. I think, unfortunately, um, this situation will be a first and it's very unusual. We see a population, uh, large numbers of children and women that have already endured more than 17 years of uh, a very rigid regime of allowing goods into Gaza. I think even in 2022, the United Nations and others said that 80 percent of the population um, you know, uh, lived on humanitarian supplies. And that's just become even more pernicious since uh, the 8th of October with all the other restrictions. And, uh, you know, the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, of the head of the Office of Coordination of Humanitarian, uh, Humanitarian Affairs, Martin Griffiths, WHO, UNICEF, I mean, it seems everybody in the international firmament has spoken with grave concern, uh, extreme concern, but we haven't seen food, water, medicines go to the most vulnerable, and they have those rights, not because of uh, something that I'm saying, it's because it's required in the Geneva Conventions and it's required in the Rome Statute. So, as of April 17th, according to humanitarian organizations and the authorities, whatever exist on the ground in Gaza, 28 children under 12 have died, including 12 babies about a month old, because of malnutrition-related conditions. The defense minister, Yoav Gallant, who today you are issuing an arrest warrant or the request for an arrest warrant for, said on October 9th, two days after October 7th, we are imposing a complete siege. There will be no electricity, no food, no water, no fuel. Everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we will act accordingly. Prime Minister Netanyahu on October 13th said, we will exact a price that will be remembered by them and Israel's other enemies for decades to come. Are those, is that the basis on which you establish intent? Or is that what, is that much, part of your evidence? Much more than that. But yes, uh, some of the words uttered by uh, the two individuals, uh, Minister of Defence Gallant and Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, are, of course, probative and relevant. Uh, the fact that so many in other individuals have said, you know, words like there's no such thing as an innocent civilian in Gaza. They're all responsible. Um, the words by members of the Security Committee. I mean, there's a whole variety of words uh, that are said and done by the government that have not been disowned, that have not been... Uh, denied, that have not, that uh, the two individuals have not disassociated themselves from, and I think that's relevant. But it's again, it's, it's a very complex operation. It's not just the denial of uh, aid. It's not only the fact that as an occupying power, Israel has an affirmative obligation to make sure food and uh, the uh, objects indispensable to survival get to the civilians. They have an affirmative obligation. They're in control of the north of Gaza, for example. Uh, IDF tanks are in situ. They could guard uh, aid convoys going in and making sure it goes to the camps. They're not doing that. But in addition, one has to look at a wider aspect. Water has been cut off. Um, electricity has been... Plants have been uh, either destroyed or targeted. Fuel can't go in. Uh, desalination... Uh, plants are completely 
dysfunctional. There's no desalination plant in the north of Gaza at all. Um, water purification tablets, um, filtration systems have been classified as dual-use um, objects, as have incubators, as has oxygen for hospital, as have anaesthetics. One sees 90% uh, of all the greenhouses in the north of Gaza destroyed, 40% of uh, the land that was used for agriculture uh, has been destroyed since uh, the, you know, uh, the conflict started. 70% uh, of the fishing vessels. I mean, every uh, avenue that is so important to human survival has been constrained or suffocated because of a policy and the words of the Secretary General of the United Nations, which said we're at breaking point, the words of UNICEF, uh, the words of UNRWA, uh, saying that we've got a trickle of aid in a sea of need. All of these, uh, you know, giants of the international system, their words, their concerns have been put to one side, unfortunately, in the face of um, other imperatives and what seems to be a bid also for the collective punishment of the uh, people of Gaza. What is the international law on the restrictions that you're talking about? And, for instance, the checking of aid convoys. The Israeli government says it is at war with a terror organization and has worked in coordination with the U.S., Egypt, and international aid agencies to get aid in. Netanyahu himself, on October 29th, after two weeks of nothing getting in, another week later said, we must prevent a humanitarian disaster. What do you make of those words? And what is the law on stopping and checking aid convoys? See, we have to look at words and analyse them against what is taking place. Prime Minister Netanyahu has been on the record to say that the access of humanitarian aid gives Israel important leeway that is being used. They've talked about a diplomatic iron dome as part of you know, allowing aid in and not allowing aid in and all the rest of it. Israel has every right not to give succour to Hamas. That is not contested. Israel has every right and indeed an obligation to get hostages back. But you must do so by complying with the law. The fact that Hamas fighters need water doesn't justify denying water from all the civilian population of Gaza. Um, there's an obligation. As I said, it's an affirmative... In addition to everything else, there's an affirmative obligation as an occupying power uh, that Israel is to make sure water, medicines, anaesthetics, insulin goes to the people that need it. If tanks can go in, why can't those tanks and those soldiers guard aid convoys? Um, so there's a lot of um, deficiencies that give rise not just to, to recklessness or negligence or indifference, but seems to be part of a criminal common plan to um, deny these objects indispensable to the survival of the civilian population and how many doctors have to talk about amputating the limbs of little babies or children without anaesthetic? Or how many people need to die uh, without insulin? Or how many people with 50% burns um, can be left by the doctors in the different hospitals because they don't have antibiotic creams for burns and they can't save them without that? For us to realise that the law is being breached. Now, this is what we have analysed and uh, we've presented it for judges who will make the final decision if warrants should be issued or not. And again, you say that you have requested these warrants based on a higher level of evidence than is normally required, not just that it is a reasonable belief that it could lead to actual warrants and a charge, but you believe your evidence has what? Well, I, uh, when I came in as prosecutor, the standard for a warrant are reasonable grounds to believe. That's what the judges have to determine. I, across all our situations, when I became prosecutor, I required the leaders in the office, the heads of the teams, to certify that there's a realistic prospect of conviction. It's not enough in these kinds of cases to have enough to issue a warrant. We must be able to bring it home. On we both sides? On both sides. And in relation to both, I've determined, and the team are unanimous, that we have a, a realistic prospect of conviction in relation to the three warrants being sought regarding the Hamas leaders and the two that are being sought in relation to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Foreign Minister Gallant. And, of course, the judges will decide if you've got it right and our analysis is spot on or not. I'm going to get to the actual how you affect these warrants, given the practicalities of the situation in a moment. But first I want to ask you about the so-called political nature that many people will claim. Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu has already said ICC charges would be a scandal on a historic scale. 
an indelible stain on the idea of justice. Uh, Israel's commitment to international law is unwavering. Uh, and Netanyahu has also said it would be an anti-Semitic hate crime. Now, we haven't heard anything from Hamas about how they would react. What do you say to that? There must have been a huge amount of pressure on you from all sides to do and not to do. Well, this court, Christian, is the child of Nuremberg. It was built because of the awful pictures that haunt us today of the Shoah and the gas chambers and then the Balkans and the list goes on. And we have to look at the evidence. And the way I very simply try to do things is look at the evidence, look at the conduct, look at the victims and airbrush out the nationality. And if a crime's been committed, we should move forward. Nobody is above the law. No people by dint of birth or passport, religion, nationality or the colour of their skin have a get-out-of-jail-free card, have a, a free pass to say, well, the law doesn't apply to us. This is a moment when we see in the shadow of Ukraine a increasing cacophony of noise of double standards and selectivity. And what we're trying to do is not go with the tide of emotion, but take our time move as effectively as we can, but be guided by evidence. And every human life, every baby that is killed, whether it's a baby that's cruelly abducted by Hamas and killed, or a baby that's been bombed or killed or has died in incubators uh, because of no electricity or water or food in Gaza, for them, for their families and for human humanity, it's a tragedy. And uh, this is why we have a court. It's about the equal application of the law. Uh, no people are better than another, and no people anywhere are saints. And so we have to apply a yardstick of legality to conduct. We've done that, and this is why we've made the applications that the judges must determine. I'm going to read you some heavy criticism that you've received from the United States. As we know, the United States is not a party to the ICC, nor is Israel. Recently, when word came out that this may be happening at some point, uh, U.S. senators and U.S. congresspeople, mostly Republicans, wrote you a letter signed by Senator Tom Cotton, Mitch McConnell, Ted Cruz, Marco Rubio, and others. This is the quote. Target Israel and we will target you. If you move forward with the measures indicated in the report, we will move to end all American support for the ICC, sanction your employees and associates, and bar you and your families from the United States. You have been warned. Is that a threat? <laughs> I think that's uh, the plain meaning of it in English. But, um, you know, there's hotheads everywhere, and there's people that are mature statesmen and stateswomen and, uh, and leaders. There are those that have fidelity to something greater than themselves, whether it's their constitutions, but ultimately it's the rule of law. Um, the good news is, I think, for the last two and a half years, we've had very positive engagement with the Biden administration in the United States. We're working across a range of situations, whether it's in Ukraine or Darfur. And I've said to uh, distinguished members on the Hill and to the administration that Rome statute values are quintessential American values. It's against bullying. It's against the untrammeled power against the most vulnerable. It's the rights and the dignity of the individual. It's the protection of babies. I mean, these are fundamental American values that should engender bipartisan support. Now, of course, this situation, unfortunately, uh, lies on the San Andreas fault of international politics and um, strategic interests. And, of course, I've had some elected leaders uh, speak to me and uh, very be, you know, be very blunt. This court is built for Africa and for thugs like Putin, was what one senior leader uh, told me. Um, we don't view it like that. This court is the legacy of Nuremberg. This court is a sad indictment of humanity. This court should be the triumph of law over power and brute force. Grab what you can, take what you want, do what you will. And uh, we're going to simply be... Un uh, we're not going to be dissuaded by threats or any other activities, because in the end, we have to uh, fulfil our responsibilities as prosecutors, as the men and women of the office, as judges, as the registry, to something bigger than ourselves, which is the fidelity to justice. And uh, we're not going to be swayed 
by the different types of threats, some of which are public and some maybe are not. You mentioned without names that there are many who have been indicted who are not in democratic states, who are essentially despots. Israel is a democracy. They have a judiciary, they have law enforcement, they have elected leaders. Why do you need to do this when they have a system that could do this? I'd much rather Israel does it. I mean, Israel, you're right, it has a, a very good uh, Supreme Court, it has uh, very qualified, brilliant lawyers. Um, but even if you read recently public information, for example, in the New York Times, I think the Bergman and uh, Mazzelli report, if one goes back to the uh, 80s and look at the CARP report, uh, a deputy attorney general of Israel who said that Israel was unwilling and unable to investigate crimes in the occupied territories, if one looks at the Sassoon report, if one w looks at General, um, uh, US three-star general that was in Washington, D.C., uh, between 2019 and 2021, who said there's no accountability, the simple truth is that for all the application of the law in the territory of Israel, unfortunately, it doesn't appear to be applied with vigour or sincerity in the occupied territories or in Gaza. And this is why we have to move forward. Of course, if Israel disagrees, if they think they are investigating the same uh, individuals and the same conduct and the policies that uh, underpin them, they are free, notwithstanding their objections to jurisdiction, to raise a challenge before the judges of the court. And that's what I would advise them to do. But um, uh, the simple truth of the matter is the disregard of the law in this situation and the policies and the utterances that are coming from the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defence, um, support and corroborate the other evidence we have from a variety of sources. I just want to fill in for our viewers. You mentioned the big New York Times magazine report this weekend by Ronan Bergman and Mark Mazzetti, an eight-year effort. It was titled Unpunished, and as you say, it is about the failure of the Israeli system, police, legal and military, to punish settlers on the occupied West Bank as they punish Arab Palestinians on the West Bank. Now, you talk about the state of Palestine and therefore you have jurisdiction over things that happen in the occupied West Bank and Gaza. There are those who disagree with you. Clearly Israel disagrees, the United States disagrees. They point out that as yet there is no official state of Palestine recognized by the Security Council. What is your jurisdiction there? Well, it's a jurisdiction that's uh, detailed in the statute and that has been decided by majority by the pretrial chamber. Leaving aside to the fact, uh, for the moment the fact that 141 countries have recognized Palestine as a state. In the General Assembly. In the General Assembly, 124 states that make up the Assembly of State Parties um, agreed for Palestine to be accepted uh, as a um, state party to the Rome Statute. And so uh, by dint of that, clearly we have jurisdiction. The Geneva Conventions also make it clear that it applies to high contracting parties. Uh, Israel is a high contracting party, as is Palestine. What does that mean? It means that they have both committed to comply with the provisions of the Geneva Conventions that includes the prohibition on starvation as a method of war, that includes the pro prohibition on taking hostages or willfully killing or extermination. I mean, these come from the Rome Statute. But originally they found form uh, in the Geneva Conventions. So we apply the law. Uh, there's been judicial pronouncements uh, by, the, by the ICC, and we have to uh, be guided by those. The Hamas leaders who you have sought arrest warrants for, do you have any hope that anybody will move against them? Do you have any hope of ever getting to them? Again, the ICC does not have a police force. You cannot go and apprehend. As far as we know, at least two of them are underground, potentially in tunnels in Gaza. And Ismail Haniya appears to be the leader involved in the political negotiations indirect between Israel uh, and Hamas, with the US, Qatar, other nations mediating. How do you expect to go after them? Who do you think is going to hand them over? Well, the first thing is for judges to rule on the applications. Um, until the judges rule on the application, all it is is an application that doesn't have legal effect. But then states have certain responsibilities and individuals have choices. If individuals say that what uh, what's alleged is not made out, it's bunkum, it's nonsense, 
um, put your case before the independent judges of the court. This court has had acquittals. This court has not confirmed cases. The record shows that uh, it's a forensic laboratory in which the evidence pr determines whether or not people are convicted, cases are confirmed or cases are kicked out. Um, that applies to Hamas leaders if they want, and if not, um, we have to see what are the other opportunities if they're either in Palestine, which is a state party, or if they're in Qatar, which is a non-state party. But in a way, that's getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, today, the announcement is the application, and the judges have to be given the time to independently and dispassionately assess what we've given. Nothing is a given. Um, they have to assess it and make a, a determination whether or not to issue uh, warrants. But I also wanted to underline the fact that you mentioned in an earlier question the allegations of anti-Semitism, the, the hate, the idea that by applying the law blindly, we are favouring one side or persecuting or being hostile to another side, and nothing can be further from the truth. Um, we have so many people of distinction that are respected, and they independently came in. I brought them in. They sat in the evidence review. Uh, this is not a witch hunt. This is not some kind of emotional reaction to noise. Uh, we've been criticised for going too slowly, criticised for going too fast. It's a forensic process that is expected of us as international prosecutors, as an independent court, to build evidence that is solid, that will not dissolve in the courtroom. And that's what we've done. Today is the fulfilment of that first stage, this first round of applications in which we say we have done our job we now give it to the judges to scrutinise. So it's not against any people and uh, it's not against uh, or for any interest. It's simply because if we don't apply the law equally, we're going to disintegrate as a species. Of course, what's happening in the West Bank mm -hmm. is uh, extremely worrying. It's an issue also that we are investigating. But uh, there's a certain... In democracies... Political choices tend to be determinative. And um, all I can say is that Israel, the leaders, the country, has a choice. That they can engage and do what is necessary to meet complementarity in the United Kingdom. In the Iraq investigations before I was appointed prosecutor, it was found that there were deficiencies in the legal system for military justice. But we have really sincerely looked at things with a broad horizon, looking at incriminating and exonerating evidence equally, looking at evidence, authenticating the evidence, and realising that we're not worth the job, the title as being a prosecutor or being lawyers or having an international criminal court if we are dissuaded because of extraneous uh, interests from moving forward. Because at the end of the day, I go back to this basic premise. A child in Myanmar that's persecuted or a child in Israel that is an orphan or that has been taken and killed or one in Ukraine, for their family, there's no difference. Their universe has been torn to shreds. And this is the need for the court and independent judges to scrutinise, not look at the politics, not look at a dysfunctional Security Council, not look at the difficulties it may cause, uh, regional organisations or different groupings, but simply say, is the evidence reliable? And if so, we go back to King John, that the king is under no man but God and the law. We all must be subject to that. Otherwise, what is this international rules-based system? What is the principles of public international law that so many men and women have given their lives for since the Second World War, particularly. And I think it's a dishonour for them. It's a dishonour for the victims of the gas chambers if we airbrush out inconvenient truths and we have to try our best to achieve justice for the victims of the 7th of October. We also must uh, try our best to do justice for so many innocent people that are suffering as we speak um, in Israel and also in, in Gaza as well as in other parts of Palestine. Prosecutor Karim Khan, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you so much.